Hi, Ryan. Hello, Rachel. I knew you were going to say that. I could feel that you were going to say that. There's this colour around you, Rachel, <laughs> or as they said, colours,、mm-hmm. which is very strange because I only see one colour, a, a purple,、oh, around I, you. I saw two. You saw two colours around yourself. Wow. No, around you. <gasps> Are they good? Am I going to live? No, I think it means that you're in danger. You're in danger. Yeah, you're in danger of having to do a podcast recording with your wife. Is it really? Hmm. I, 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 I believe, believe. I believe that is what you are destined to what are, do what are the for yum about yum, the next hour. What are the yum yum colors? What would you? What、uh, colors would you assign each of the yums?、Uh, my mine are yellow and pink. Those、mm. are my yum yum colors. A vibrant yellow and a vaginal pink is my criteria、mm. for the colors of yum yum. I was yum, thinking yum. pink and purple. Pink and purple, yeah, purple. Purple's good. You can't go wrong with purple. So we're Yum Yum Podcast. We're a husband and wife team that are rewatching or not rewatching. In this case, I'm so used to saying that we're watching episodes of science fiction television. We're going over them. We're reviewing them. Sometimes we're rewatching them as we tend to do. We've、uh, gone through some Babylon Five, some Star Treks,、uh, and today、uh, on this show, Yum Yum and Beyond, we're looking at Space Above and Beyond, a television series that I have seen before, but you, Rachel, have not. You haven't seen it. No, I have not. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? I'd never heard of it until you brought it up. How could you not have heard, especially with an episode like the one we looked at just now?、Uh, but for those out there listening, unlike those watching or sniffing,、uh, we are going through these with.、Uh, No spoilers abound. I mean, spoiling the episodes that we are watching, but I won't give away how things go. This is though a cancelled television series, so it's not as if there's too much. I mean, there are things to to reveal that I could, but、yeah. I know that the series ends. It ends. <laughs> You no 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 like the fact that you know it has an ending is something、oh, because no but like I know that they knew that they were it was ending so、mm. they went out with a bang that's what I wanted to say yeah they go out with a very specific thing in mind let's just say that but we watched last week one of the highest rated episodes who monitors the birds. We're just now over the halfway point of this series,、uh, and we are looking at and talking about today episode thirteen out of twenty three, level of necessity. And Rachel, you had a few guesses last episode,、mm-hmm. mainly revolving around Damfu. Mm-hmm. About her getting stuff to do, having stuff with Damfu as a character, being focused on a bit, but also you did a bit of backpedal backpedaling as, as you are,、uh, <laughs> as you're known for, where you also said, oh, but I imagine she's just going to be a part of the ensemble and she just does a little bit more. Yeah, because、so、I was just like, both- oh, they won't. They've, they've almost done it for a couple of times.、Mm-hmm. I don't want to bank on it. Actually, being about her. But so you were right and wrong. You had a gut feeling. No, it was more than that. I'm. It scared me. What are you gonna write on the report? An explanation to explain the unexplainable. This is what they wrote. This is what they wrote, and I actually want to、uh, compare and contrast this with what we just looked at. After experiencing a vision of a soldier's death during a combat mission, Damfu is investigated by a psychor colonel who is convinced she possesses psychic powers. I'm so glad that I didn't. Read that description before I watch this episode. 
I, yeah. I uh, am so glad that we don't do that as part of this format. On YouTube, this is one of the ones that people have uploaded the original TV spot promos for, and it is very aggressive and leans heavily into the very uh, 1990s fascination with telepathy. Yes. Uh, we when we when we talk about Babylon Five, there's telepathy in that, but I never talk about it as this fad of the 1990s no. because of how well realized it is and the metaphor that they're going for within that one but here i felt it very much was dated and there's even a description on imdb that i want to read that i i think encapsulates uh this overall 90s uh, uh 90s attraction to the psychic Deep underground, the 58th are on the run from hostiles. They meet another squadron whose commander orders them to enter another tunnel. Danfu refuses and tells the 58th not to go because of a vision and a feeling. The other, the other squad member, the other, the other squad die. And then this is where it is, Rachel. Could it be ESP? And that there, <laughs> that there was written by Keith is me, uh, a very well known uh, IMDb description writer for uh, Space Above and Beyond. He's written about seventy percent of them, or they. Uh, Keith is me. Thank you, Keith. She's a soldier with the power to predict the future. You have a gift, Vanessa. You can harness this gift to save lives. This Sunday. You gotta get out of there now, sir. Her squadron is going into battle. Roman, stop! And she knows that all of them won't make it back alive. One more of us is gonna die. Ah, don't miss Space Above and Beyond. A brand new episode, Sunday at 7, 6 Central on Fox. We're, we, we were born in the early 90s, so this is a bit of a hazier experience for us. But do you recollect that that cultural zeitgeist thing of ESP? Yes, I do. I do. I'll, and, like, I've, of course, learned since more about it. Mm. The Like, as soon as he brings up Bending Spoons, I'm like, oh, Yuri Geller reference. Mm. And that whole period of time where it, it, like, it was a sort of offshoot of the supernatural focus of a lot of pop culture media in the 90s mm. of, like, we had a lot of vampires, a lot of werewolves, a lot aliens. of witches, aliens. And this sort of spurred off from those things, this very much like there's something beyond your understanding approach to telepathy or premonitions in a, a lot of random things. Like this feels like it comes out of fucking nowhere. I I don't know where it spawned from, but I do remember growing up and the tail end of this was happening, uh, would you say it morphed and it changed to whatever the secret was, that thing? You remember the secret? Where I do. I've read the secret. My mum bought me where <laughs> my mum bought me the you can secret see, you, workbook when yeah, I was 13. You, you could see I how, did not read the book when I was 13. You could see how ESP leads to yeah, something like the secret. Like the, the secrets of the universe and there's an untold truth. And if you just use your mind and your soul and your feelings, you can manifest crap. And I don't know what was really the kicking off for this, but I do heavily remember it. I would say that level of necessity 
is one of the few episodes that we've watched in Space Above and Beyond where I felt the X-Files of the soul. X-Files, you haven't watched as much as I have, but X-Files, even at its best, was very involved in what was happening now. There was, a, yeah. a, a, you could tell that the writers were always looking at news articles or magazines or folk tales and gathering those and reworking those into their narratives. Glenn Morgan and James Wong would do that themselves all the time. When they left Space Above and Beyond, they came back and wrote one of the most depraved episodes of X-Files, one of the most well-regarded as well, Home, and for them, they didn't understand why it was such a critical smash and also uh, uh, such a scary one because Mm. they just took it from what they always did, media, what was happening at the time, just things on people's minds, things that were in discussion. And that is what I got from this. This is something where it was incredibly dated to me. It didn't feel futuristic. It didn't feel like it had a lot of commentary to make on the overall themes that we've been uh, delving into. This just felt felt like a detour. And now we have an ESP episode. That's, That's it. We have an ESP episode because I read about it in a magazine and maybe it could work in our show. It's sort of like a very special, very special episode sort of thing. Uh, how did you feel about this? What was your overall takeaway with level of necessity? It was odd, but I didn't not like it. But I don't know if I like shit. Mm. Why is it a struggle? It's given us a lot of what we've been asking for, a Dan yeah. food centered episode. The actress was spectacular. Yes, yes, okay. A pretty good guest star, R- yeah. Richard Kind. Richard, I love Richard Kind. We all love Richard Kind. Uh, Do you think like one of his best things is the nanny? The nanny, not Spin City. No, I really love the episode of the nanny that he's in. <laughs> was he Even ever? Though. Was he ever in Gilmore Girls? That that feels like he should have been. I mean, you loved him in Inside Out. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's great in a lot of things, but in everything, pretty like much. him doing the hustle with <laughs> Fran Drescher, <laughs> and then he's very good threatening at playing to kill himself. He's, he's very good at playing manipulative pieces of shit. Yes, yet he has such a kind face, mm-hmm. uh, kind Richard, mm-hmm, kind mm-hmm, haha. Mm-hmm. Didn't mean that, but kind of. Ooh, yeah. I did it again. Kind of. <laughs> I mean it! I'm gonna jump! Jeffrey, please, I'll do whatever you say! Sleep with me. What's your second choice? <laughs> Another date. Uh, uh, what else you got? Uh, okay, fine, that's it. No, Jeffrey, wait, wait! Uh, maybe you should take off your heels. Are you crazy? That would screw up my balance completely! It doesn't feel like this is the kind of universe where telepathy exists. And that is a part of the fabric of the episode as well because like she doesn't believe it and nobody else believes it it's just richard kind that comes in being like hey i think you have special powers and it's just like "Uh, uh, what now i agree what now and it like It just takes too long for you to get on board with the idea of it because it doesn't feel like it belongs in this show. Like, the way that the characters we know and the way, like, like the way that our crew is reacting to this makes sense and feels right and it's well written and well directed, but it doesn't feel like it should be an idea for an episode of Space and Bo- Above and Beyond, but it does really feel like an episode of Space Above and Beyond because mm. all of these markers are here and it's like, well, and this is the adventure and mission that the crew is on this week. Uh, it lost its way for me. I was giving it a lot of... Uh, 
suspension of disbelief, swallowing the premise as it went along. I was very much drawn in by these performances, and I do agree the direction was、uh, top notch for what we had available to us. But it just spotted along, and there came a point where. Whatever leeway I was giving it just went away. It's not as if there was one thing that broke it or one thing that pushed me over the edge. It was just I got bored.、Uh, I just got bored of it very quickly. Uh, uh, once they went on the mi- mission again to go to the planet, I I I just had a hard time grasping onto this. The Psychic powers thing is so out of place for this for this universe. Yes. <laughs> if this was introduced, if you had to rearrange this and say you swapped the run like the 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 place this episode was put in with the fear planet one, which was earlier in the season. Would this be easier to swallow? Where we're still in the introductory phase of the series, where we're getting to know the world, the rules, and the characters, and the mythos. I I think it would to a degree, but you, I think what I would have preferred is one or both of these ideas being threaded through,、hmm. which is that. The evil corporation is doing something with psychic abilities,、mm. and or the silicates on the torture planet are doing something with it, or like something's mentioned、mm. there. I I just don't welcome this. I reject it. I don't need this. I don't need this in my World War Two in space. I know the Nazis did all, all kinds of fucking experiments. Just what does this offer to Damfu as a character, other than now she has a thing? Because out of them, she hasn't had a thing. She has a boyfriend back home, and he has a daughter, and he's a cook, and he cooks her things while writing letters, and she has to sniff what it is. And she's just a very nice person, and she's an engineer. She hasn't had her big dramatic thing. Wang has with his torture. That's really given him something to explore in the series. So, what do you do? I give her a power, I guess, and that is where you immediately fail as a writer. Right there, you're 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 twelve, thirteen episodes in, and you say to yourself, "Oh, we need to make Dan Fu a better character. What do we do? I don't know. Give her a power, I guess." <laughs> It just feels very half-hearted and lazy to me. Oh, I don't know what to do with this character. Give him a power, I guess. A power is not a substitution for a character. And admittedly, they do try to emphasize her as a person. In this, and not just focus on now. I have cool mind powers. What do I do with them? But the mind powers should not be here. We're too late into the show. Even though this is the first season of what would have been five, you already have given us the 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 rules. You've given us. The robots. You've given us the tanks. You've given us the chigs. You've given us your technology.、Yeah. And it's been a while since we've had something new introduced.、Mm. Like even though we didn't see the silicates for a while, we were introduced to them、mm. in the like first... episode two. Yeah, yeah, and the. Chigs, since they're un- unknown on purpose, you can drip feed us new things about them. That's how they are. Wor- that's how they're designed. But humanity, yeah, they're we, the antagonists. They're the antagonists. So when they can have a shapeshifter that looks like West's girlfriend, that can be a surprise and a and a reveal that we can believe in. Feels earned. Yeah, and it feels earned, and it's in line with what we knew of those guys that they're shifty. But we are twelve, thirteen episodes in. We're we're, we're halfway through the first season. 
Uh, and we know who the human race is at this point. You've established what we are. We are not Star Trek. We are not a united Earth. We're not nice. We're bigoted and hate-filled, but also all of these noble and good qualities. But we're just people. And then we have the tanks, which are uh, different to us, but also not much. And that was enough. That was enough. But now we're getting, oh, there are people who have psychic abilities. And it's just very much unwelcomed to my viewership. It's a, a step too far of science fiction overload. Uh, I, I also get why at the same time, because the show yeah. has been leaning in the last, what feels like the last six episodes, into the war show side of it. So this is it leaning into the science fiction side again. I, I think they just overbalanced it. I think they just teed it off and went into the deep end where I just rolled my eyes a lot. <laughs> and and the special effect for the psychic ability is very lame. It's not even bad. It's yeah. just kind of lame. Even if they had good effects by modern <laughs> it's, standards, there's still a lame I'm, presentation. Yeah, the idea of it's sort of underwhelming by design. Do you believe, Vanessa, that humans are actually capable of such things. I'm trained as an engineer. Everything I've ever been taught tells me that those things are impossible. That's right, Vanessa. That's why you've been denying your anomalous intuition. It's very incompetent as an episode of television and there's an episode just, of Space there's Above a and Beyond. problem with the concept, and it's very hard to move beyond that, especially because everything else is pretty good. Or really good. Like, we've already acknowledged the performances of everybody are really good. Mm. Even the dude that gets killed eventually. Yeah, he gets his leg hacked off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, even he is pretty good. And Demfu is fucking killing it. The actress is doing an amazing job in this series with very little, and here is an episode where they've given her more. And with the Fear Planet episode, they gave her more. And the writing makes me not like her character, but the actress is just so warm and personable and very empathetic in her portrayal of the character that I'm managing to go over the writing shortcomings with her. Uh, if we looked at it strictly from what is the script, Damfu would be a character I do not like at all. I would say she's underdeveloped. I would say she's useless. I would say that she's a worrywart and a troublemaker in the group, especially with the Fear Planet one. But when you have a, a living, breathing person making this character something new... Uh, it really does change the game because you can have well, well uh, conceived characters, but if you don't have the right actor in the role, then it can yeah. really let it down. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek, you can Deanna Troy. I'm just gonna say, all the writing that you need, but yeah, if the actor sucks, it falls flat. It falls flat, and we've seen that in this show, in the reverse of good writing being further elevated by a good actor, especially in a guest spot. Yes, I am talking about Mr. Ray Butts. Or just McQueen regularly in this series. Uh, Jane Morrison just elevates it and elevates it even when it's already excellent. And he was excellent in this. I missed him when he wasn't here. I also missed Commodore Ross. I'm just going to say it again. Miss that guy. McQueen. Extra sexy in this episode. Yeah, his hair was a little bit more shaggy in this one. Uh, I noted that. Yeah, but like him in the dress uniform at the start. Uh, uh, okay. Star Trek really cemented this for me. And so if you're a science fiction writer or somebody who's interested in making science fiction in the medium of television and film 
or any visual medium, uh, don't do cave sets anymore. Okay, I'm sick of fucking seeing them. I hate them. You they hate always when ba- sci-fi does rocks. Not just rocks. But not you, just rocks. You hate cave, it. cave sets and tunnels. They're always very, very bad. Yeah, but if it's you like- if you had to put a gun against my head and t- say, Ryan, what is a consistently bad setting in science fiction? It's it's caves. Yes, yes, but I think a part of it is because they can't do rocks well enough. So they can't do ground. It's just a gloomy, it's, uh, murky, confined space that doesn't make me want to stick around. It's boring. It's boring. It's cheap. Every time it looks cheap. I I I I I'm getting angry because I actually rather like the opening of this with Cooper having to crawl underneath this area where it was really confined. He was getting stuck there and then it caved in on him and they had to get him out. This was actually the opposite of what I complain about with the cave sets where rarely also do I feel the danger of caves in these shows. It's just a a place to be because it's easy to make them like just have a bunch of styrofoam rocks about and then that's that's your set. I didn't feel the danger when they went back. That's the problem. They go back. When they first had the cold opening of it, he gets caved in, they drag him out and they meet that other group and then they get killed in the hole. It was rather suspenseful. It used the environment correctly. It showed us how the cramped, confined and labyrinth nature of it all is actually rather scary and dangerous and disorientating. But then we just go back and it's just wandering they, around a bunch of fake rocks. It's after, I I can't remember if it's just once or a couple of times of them being like, is this far underground? And that's scary for anybody. And it's just like, they're not underground. I'm, yeah. They're not several hundred feet down. Do you think... That there's something wrong. You were in a combat situation 350 meters underground. I understand the stress. What were the aspects that didn't work for you about this? What were the aspects that were lacking? Uh, Honestly, we've already said it. And it's just I couldn't get past the premise. I just, I couldn't get past it. And I'm like, I I don't even know if you're going to even get to touch this stuff again. If you're going to just dump it because it didn't really work. Hmm. Mm. A premise really can be the be all and end all. Even if it is executed with precision it can m- still impede your viewership of a piece of entertainment where I am like you, where I just can't move beyond it. As much as I try, as much as I want to, I I can't because it feels so wrong. It is just one of those things where you go, that's wrong, guys don't do that but nobody told them no nobody said don't do that they just did because well it's their first season they're figuring it out yeah and it's it's a it's a mistake that i'll i'll I'll, I'll just put it like this if this psychic stuff comes up more in the series then maybe i'll look back on this in a more forgiving light but, but if this never comes that up again you've then i'd be fine it before and you feeling this way like i i don't, like i'm reading into that that it doesn't come back well there's some things that way. i didn't remember yeah. until this rewatch and i'm like oh that does come back in a meaningful yeah, way but, but just because you're like uh, it still feels like it comes out of nowhere. Well, it does. 
if again, if this was swapped in the episode running order with the Fear Planet episode, then maybe I would be more understanding because that was in the introductory phase of the series where each episode was, now we're doing a character episode on this person and this person and this person. Okay, I want to I wanna give some props because I feel oh, like I don't know what to get into about this episode. Um. Because not a lot happens either. Yeah, it's a it's it's a boring mission. They have to make sure that the chigs don't have things that can help them yeah, fight. Yeah, they they end up um, destroying an ammunition depot, hmm. killing a couple of chigs in the process. And the ammunition depot is a big cave set, but with some glowing coils. Yeah, <laughs> and a big rock for them to roll off of. That's it. That's it. Um, there are a few bits of dialogue or scenes that mm. I would like to say. Good job, writers. Good job, writers. There were some good lines. I actually rather like the ending. It brought in mm. that Dan Fu is religious, which we've already yeah, picked up the on. Serenity it, prayer. It was it was in line with what she had gone through that mm-hmm. she would turn to prayer in this moment because yeah. at the end there is no solid answer. No. And that is something I actually do praise as well. They don't end the mm-hmm. episode with with everybody going, well, Dan Fu, you do have psychic abilities mm-hmm. and we'll be able to use it for this in the storylines to come. Yeah, It is, even if you do have it, what do we use it for? Because yeah. it's so nebulous and strange. Um, it's, not, yeah. it's not book from Star Trek Discovery where it's no. like, you have empathy powers and this is how we're going to use them for storylines in a very uh, mechanical and clinical fashion. We're not going to use them consistently because they would just give us an easy out too early in the episode. Book, so. do your empathy thing. They're not doing that. <sighs> no, it's they're not clear that. at the end of this they're not going to do that with Denver. It's not, no. Denver, use your psychic thing. Yeah. Then they're not going to run around, but that's some praise there. Uh, yeah. What were the lines or moments that uh, leapt out at you? I really, really fucking loved the scene when they're debating over what happened, when they're all in their bunks mm. and they're just talking like people do, where, like, some of the time they're talking a little bit over each other. They're all stating their perspective on something because something has stimulated this conversation about intuition and they all have a, a unique perspective that's reflective of who they are for, like, the ones that we know and for these other characters that are sort of fleshing out the 58? Winslow is the name of the woman that had the story about... Mm, uh, the pilot. The pilot. That took the day off. Took the day off and they got killed anyway mm-hmm. because that's how it played out because death is coming to get you. Mm. She was in the Christmas episode. She was yeah. the lady in the Christmas yeah. one. And so they they are getting these ones to yeah, come back again. Yeah, they're paying attention and it, you're rewarded for having paid attention and watched previous episodes. That was a highlight scene for me as well because of the statement you said about them talking over each other and they all felt very human and natural. It was a a real conversation and it was just really enjoyable to watch because I wasn't hyper aware that I was watching a TV show for a little while. I put it down to the direction and acting a lot too because yeah. for for my liking that is where the that 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 personhood came from. The mm. writing to me smelt too much of the guys spooky, huh? How We're doing things this thing, go. of course, like everybody has to have their say. Mm. And you know each character's going to have their little moment. Like it could feel like that if the direction was different or if the acting was different. It's not just the script that Mm. pulls this off. It's 
all of those things working together. Mm. And I really appreciated that because even in like other shows that we're watching, not for the pod, I've been getting a bit frustrated lately watching things and it's just like, oh, I can feel that this is a script. You can feel the writer's hand. Um, Even sometimes when it's in a, a good way. Yeah. But just that this felt like a conversation that essentially work colleagues would have. And bunkmates would would have. Yeah, like they're in a specific sort of situation and these are the kind of conversations that you expect people to have. And obviously neither of us have first-hand experience with... Premonitions. And... Military service. No, I, I, I genuinely thought you were going to, because their conversation is about <laughs> premonitions and all that stuff. Neither you or I have ever had that. I don't, I've never had that kind of conversation that they're having about. I have. I really haven't. No, my family is not believers in that. Oh, that's right. You guys really are, aren't you? We're not. My The Slowinskis were very much like, ghosts? No general sense of destiny and ooh, no we're not i i want to question you with this i want to question you with this and see if you can answer Mm -hmm. which horror movie uh -hmm. which horror movie is about a similar thing where people can see how death is going to happen to them, and they try and avoid it, but in so avoiding Final it, Destination? And you know who wrote and created Final Destination? James it's Wong Wonga. and Glenn Morgan. I was going to say Wong, and I was like... No, both of them. Both, like, both of them. Is it they didn't write this specific uh, episode, but they did, obviously, as showrunners, have their yeah. hands involved. And I was looking at it from that lens of going, oh... I'm glad that I didn't know that. <laughs> no, no. I think this is a neat little artifact of, mm. of a creator, because you can see the seed, the germ of what would grow into the Final Destination franchise, which I actually rather like the Final Destination movies. Unironically, I think Mm. that 1 and 3, which are the ones that James Morgan and... uh, uh, Glenn Morgan and James Wong are heavily Mm. involved in, they're actually very good. But uh, you can see... Forever made a generation afraid of driving behind Mm -hmm. trucks on the highway. And he's got Tony Todd. Uh, but you can see. Yeah, yeah, you definitely can. You definitely can. But that's why I'm glad that I didn't know about that on my first watch because I would have been expecting certain things that I already ended up expecting. But we'll get we'll get to that. I want to talk about another few positive moments or lines. I really liked Vanson. In this episode. She was no nonsense. She was no nonsense exactly the way that we know her to be. And just like her lines about how, like, we have our orders, we have our mission, you're here as an observer, you're going observe, when he's just kind of like, I'll stay here. She's like, Mm. no, you're not. He also tried to pull rank one or two times, like, you have no rank. You're 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 beneath me, yeah. Uh, Vanson does not yeah. get pushed around in this, and I I, I also appreciated that. I I, I also, also want to say that the actress has really found how to play that bravado yeah. of the character. Yeah. Early on, we saw sometimes there was a struggle there because. I can just tell that the actress is not like that in real life mm-hmm. a bit, but that has faded yeah. away. Uh, and it's that that kind of sheepishness yeah. has been left to Damfu, and it helps yeah. uh, different uh, give a differentiation between the the two females of the group. Where you do have Damfu, who's a little bit more uh, shy, a little bit more reserved, yeah. but also a go getter. 
And you have Vance, mm-hmm. who's far more, you know, mm-hmm. full on military mm-hmm. lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, I enjoyed her very much. Yeah, I wish she was in more of the episode. I wish she was more present because she did bring a smile to my face mm. every time she did have something to do or say. There's another line that I really liked, but I want to discuss it in the broader context of the scene because thinking about it, I'm like, oh my god, they have come a really long way. The briefing scene with McQueen. Mm. where they're like, you're going back to the tunnels. <laughs> that is so much better than the briefing scene. I wish he threw a table over them. <laughs> I miss that. Even Wang made fun of that in a previous episode yeah. when he did his impression. I, I really do miss the table flip. Yeah, that was fun. And but him I teaching us like, what's a bitch this week. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. I was just like, this, this feels so much better than it does did in those first couple of episodes. But I really, really liked... <laughs> what was her name again? The Winslow? Winslow. I'm pretty sure it's her. He's like, we did our time in hell. <laughs> yeah, she said it very well. That's a corny line, but she, she, yeah, she, she nailed the delivery it. of she it. She sold it. And I'm like, it's so frustrating because so much of this episode is good, but it's not greater than the sum of its parts. This is a great TNG effect where you have a very likable cast for the most part and they're given lacklustre material, but you, the viewer, will suffer it because the cast is likable enough and you know the characters well enough to go, ah, this isn't their best adventure. Maybe the next one will be better. And you don't often get to say that in a first season of a science fiction show, including TNG, where it's like, who the fuck are these characters? They're these weird, stiff, robotic assholes. And one of them. Season three of TNG getting there. Yeah, season three is when it really clicks into place. Mm. I want to just praise my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes. uh, uh, And it was the shot compositions and the lighting and the. And the oppressive atmosphere, but the... When they're going down to the... The interrogation between Damfu... Oh, oh, yeah, that's fucking amazing. ...and Richard Kind, and how it zooms in on his mouth and he keeps repeating these phrases and it's just an overall interrogation Don't and... Mon- act. Yeah. Like, it is the perfect kind of scene to do that sort of montage with. And Richard Kind is the brilliant actor to pick for this because you can't pin down if he's another sinister guy from the military or the corporation or if he's an oddball, he's an eccentric, Mm. he's crazy, or he's a brilliant good man. Richard Kind is actually perfect for that because he's a lovable Uh guy. He plays goofy characters, but he's also known to play pricks and assholes. He can do both. He 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 is an... Uh, he has a range to him as an actor that people don't acknowledge enough. No. And to bring him in here where his presence, if you know him or you don't, he has a look to him. Yes. That, those those pouty lips and that Cheshire cat smile, mm-hmm. but those cold eyes. He has these kind of yeah. like blackened eyes that look uh, through you. No. He, he, he really mm. rides the line here where in that interrogation scene, you can't tell if this is another kind kind of fascist propaganda agent from the government or from the military mm-hmm. coming in, or if he's something more good than that. And we slowly mm. peel that away as we go along. But that overall thing where he's just repeating the mm-hmm. phrase over and over and over again, really, really yeah. well done. You know what really helps with that? The way that he's set up by McQueen. Mm. I'm pretty sure it's like after we first meet him and it's just like if he's like any of these other dudes, he will find a logical solution. Mm. Mm. And it's just it's just like, well, that's the one thing he's not going to do then, I guess. Well, we don't know that because he says that he's an accountant. That was his background. So you can almost believe that he would do that because he's – Richard Kine, who's also a guy that looks meek and mild-mannered, and he would be a, a nebbish accountant man. An engineer. Problem solver, comfortable with the quantifiable. It's 
kind of like me. I'm an accountant by training. People generally like you. That's a nice thing, isn't it? You care about people, yes? I suppose. You seem to know quite a bit about me, sir. Yes. Level of Necessity is an episode of television that is there to fill up time and space. This is one where it is the lowest rated episode of the series by just point one in comparison oh. to the Fear Planet. Okay. And I gather... I get why. From, I get why. For my reading of it, because I've actually listened to some podcasts about Space Above and Beyond, and most of them that aren't just a, a retrospective on it where they go, oh, remember this show from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and they haven't even watched it recently. Ones that I know exist are podcasts that look at the worst-rated episodes of shows, and they look at this one with no context to the rest of the series, and they walk away thinking it's not that bad, and that it's just a slightly mediocre piece of television. Why I think it's bad for the context of the series is, even the Fear Planet managed to do this, it doesn't really connect to the overall messaging and themes of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did this need to be a Space Above and Beyond episode? No. No. It's just, oh, let's do an ESP story and give it to damn foo, I guess. There's a war setting, they're doing a mission, but it's not connecting to that war theme, nor is it connecting to the existing science fiction stuff that this show is tackling. It's not really giving me any commentary about humanity. It's not giving me any real commentary about society. It's not really giving me any commentary about, honestly, anything no. other than you got to believe in yourself. Yeah. You got to you got to believe the dream of seeing mm. purple crap around people and woo. I would not woo. say that no. di- woo woo. And I think this is a betrayal of character for for Damfu. She is a reserved person, but I would never say that she's one that lacks confidence in herself. No, no. Like especially the way that she uh, conducted herself in, in the mutiny episode. Mm, mm, or choice or chance. Yeah. I, I think she's far more strong-willed mm. than the writers of this episode of have her, given her credit like, for. Holding her own against those two dudes. Yeah, yeah. In their engineering sense and, you know, working together but also being confident but not not cocky during that subplot mm-hmm. that she's given. I, I think it shows a chance where she has to mm. calm down Shane and convince Shane, and it shows us that although Damfu can be the one that's a quieter person, she's actually got far more uh, far more maturity to her. I, yeah. I, I think that this is, they look at the character and they go, oh, she's kind of a little bit quiet. That must mean that she's insecure. I don't think yeah, that's, no. that's what I got from this episode is their characterization of her, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't sync up doesn't with what jump. I've been getting in the series. Mm, yeah. And maybe I've been giving more credit to the character than they have, mm. but uh, I just... Uh, are you shocked that this is the lowest rated episode? No. It's a, I think a 6.8. No. Yeah, I'm... Yeah, I, I, I see it as being down there with the fear episode. Mm. Um, Which do you prefer? This one. Mm. Mm. This one. Yeah, I I would have to say I prefer this one as well. Just uh, this just one because has things that I liked in and good people, direction, and people didn't weren't make screaming f- in it all the time. Oh God, it didn't make me feel like they want the director's goal was to make me vomit like I was on a 
poorly constructed amusement ride. I still give this a yum. Yum. I give it a yum yum. Yum yum. Really? This gets a yum yum? Oh, no, no, not like. <sighs> no, no, you're you're entitled to your rating. I'm just I'm just no, surprised. Like... Oh, okay. Here's why I feel like it's it's barely it's barely. Yum yum, because I like everything but the premise. <laughs> I like everything but the premise, and it's like it should be that it has a rotten core, so I don't like it at all. But I really like the performance. I'm I'm really pleased with Richard Kind. I liked Vanson. I liked Cooper. There were good scenes too. And good scenes. Like I really like that Cooper's like, don't fucking tell me when I'm gonna die. Don't fucking tell me when I'm gonna die. Don't fucking tell me when I'm die. You're fucking telling me when I'm gonna die for shut the fuck up. But do good scenes make a good episode? No. Yeah, but I understand your your reasonings as to why you would give this a, a yum yum okay, because I just don't there's feel enough- like it's honest for mm. me to give it a yum. Yes, it's a not good episode, but I don't just don't feel in my heart that I think that it's bad. Mm. Next time on Space Above and Beyond, we'll be talking about never no more. No, as in. No, you don't. Not as in, I know who you are. So, never know more. Mm-hmm. Uh, any ideas of what that will have in store for us? It's, it's vaguely Edgar Allan poe <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, what, you think he's going to come to the ship and they're like, Not- hey, Edgar Allan Poe, how did you get here? If they introduced a time travel one after the psychic one, would you be surprised? Yes, I would. I would too, actually. That's a little bit too far-fetched. But uh, what do you think? A wormhole? Yeah. Well, they do have wormholes in this. Yeah. Do you see, like, something happening with a wormhole other than Raybutt's dying in one? Mm-hmm. I kind of hope that that comes back in some way. Uh, like, the idea of the wormhole, not Raybutt's is corpse. Um. I don't know. Tell me the title again. Never know more. You have no clue. It's too vague of a title for you. Um. Yeah, and it's also like what I have ideas, and I'm like, oh, but they already did that. It's like the idea of like refusing orders. Hmm. Like you're never allowed to say no. Anymore. Maybe this is the mutiny episode. Oh, wait. Yes. <laughs> Had that, like, uh, I'm going through, like, oh, what could this mean? I'll make it easy, easier for you. You remember this one? I don't remember it from the title. Okay. Reading it, I go, oh, this is the one. But the title is mm-hmm. not one where okay. I go, oh, of course. So um, I can understand why it's hard because it is a, like, level of necessity. It is uh, a, a title where it exists so that you know that they'll probably say it in the episode, but yeah. it's not one where it's as poignant as um, some of the previous. Uh, my guess is that it's going to be a more Saratoga-centered episode again. Like, a lot of this one happened on the Saratoga Slash the cave sets, obviously. Mm. Do you think this will be an ensemble or a character piece? Like ensemble. Specific- ensemble. Do you think uh, the chicks will it- show up? No, because we got a solid amount of chig action. In the last episode in this. In this, but we also didn't get any sort of new lore about the chigs. We got, like, intelligence. Intelligence. And we but, got to see how their guns work, though. Uh, yeah. That was yeah. just something that I noted down. They gave us I didn't, close-ups I didn't. and they showed us about how they fire them, their, their mm-hmm. arm movements towards it and yeah, how their guns fire out. I thought that was a neat little thing. to the last episode thing. when Cooper was trying to figure out how to yeah, do it. Yeah, and he, he couldn't, he he couldn't, couldn't work do it. it. 
Yeah, that was, um, that was and that was visual storytelling. Yeah. yeah. They didn't yeah. draw attention and our characters didn't even notice it. We, the audience, yeah, got to notice it. Yeah, I didn't it. even think about the fact that we didn't know that. Mm. That's why I didn't, you know, slot it in as Something. part of my developing Chig lore. I file. like how they dispense Chig lore to I us. I do. I really like the way that it's woven in. Like, it, it doesn't, it's not even fair to say that it's drip fed. It feels like it's just woven into the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I look forward to discussing the next episode. Uh, I think it will be better than this one. This is a low point, even for my lo- like. Look, I didn't hate it, but this was a lower point, and maybe because yes. we just had the best episode of the show for me. Mm. It's a it's a thing that Babylon Five does where it'll give us one of the greatest episodes and then the worst episode immediately afterwards. So it is the gamble that these shows used to take, where they'll go, "Hey, we gave them a really good episode. How do we follow it up? I have a shit episode, I guess. We've got to get that out of the way." Uh, very strange thinking there. Uh, but that is all we've got for you. You can find us on all of the social media platforms under Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. You can email us with your thoughts on Space Above and Beyond. Where are you up to with it? Are you watching it over again? Are you a longtime fan or a first time viewer? Like what did me. you think of Level of Necessity? Is it as bad as everybody says? Or you like Rachel and liked it even in spite of all of that? We'd love to hear from you over at yumyumpod at gmail.com you can email us directly there as well as support the show financially at Patreon. We have a Patreon where we upload many pieces of content. In fact, if you're listening to this on the main feed, we've already talked about Space Above and Beyond over on the Patreon, so you can Mm -hmm. head over to us over there and hear what we have to say about future episodes, including Never Know More. Uh, Rachel? Pags Pags was not here. you, you, You took the words right out of my mouth. You gobbled them up like Pags would have done with a packet of chips. Because I do. You have ESP? Do you have ESP? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in ESP? Do you believe in that? You kind of hinted that your family believes in a bunch of spooky, mystical crap. But do you believe in ESP? (sighs) The look is of a woman wanting to say yes, but doesn't want to say it audibly. Because <laughs> it means you have to say it out loud. No, no, I, like, I... Ultimately, no. No. I have a lot of deja vu. mm as a person, like, I am... They explain that in this episode, what yeah, is. Yeah. And I'm like, I know that it has a logical explanation, but it still feels fucking weird when I have a moment in my life where I'm like, I swear I knew this was going to happen, and not in a, oh, well, this was obvious. It's like, this is a weird situation. Why didn't my brain go, oh, yeah. I experienced... And I'm like, this... Is this an anxiety brain thing as mm, well? Mm. Like, I do not think that, cl- yeah. Being clairvoyant like, is anxiety brain. Yeah, but I don't fucking know. I My experience... sister now goes. Oh, and really? Get, yeah. Get, Gives palm readings and crap. I, I'm like, I have. Crystal balls I, or reds. I, I have a set of tarot cards and <laughs> I occasionally use them. But you do. Mostly I got them because they're pretty. And, uh, and I use them to make a house of cards. I do not experience deja vu as often as most people. I experience more often that uh, sense of somebody walking over your grave, that kind of mm. cold shudder that goes over you, but that also could just be me going... Oh, I'm sad now. Uh, rather than that actual, ooh, someone's going over my grave, like, See, like scared. Ooh. When I get that feeling, uh, that shudder, mm. I can always, like, feel it 
it coming on before the actual shutter, you know? Like, <laughs> it's like the equi- sort of the equivalent of, like, I can feel the boot on my grave and then the shiver because of the boot. Could you remind me, what does ESP stand for? I don't know. What do you mean? What do you mean you don't know? I don't know off the top of my head. I can't remember. Is it electro... Psychic. Psychic spelled with a P. So that would be the last one, right? Is it electro shock pags? Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you'd give me the real answer, then I'll be like, no, the last word is pags. Here's the pags. 